welcome back to the program on set with us are some special guests who are going to help us understand more about the topic of today's discussion. Edward and Nyakiriga, you sponsored the anti-homosexuality bill back way back in 2014. Perhaps you can tell us what was the force behind the sponsoring of that bill? From the preamble of the, our constitution, it is provided that we acknowledge God. Anything that is immoral, anything that was against uh, religion is actually uh, a prohibition for our nation. That is the force behind. We saw that our society was uh, being interfered with by social behavior that is attributed by foreign uh, colleges. We thought that if we have a statute, if we have a, a sanction, it will be proper. The petition starts by say, stating, we the undersigned Republican Liberty Party, but most of the time when you read about the bill, it's associated with you personally. Being a lawyer, I drafted the, the bill, but uh, the research and the force behind it was uh, a corporate affair. It was uh, assistance from other members of the party who did the research and saw that uh, our society was going down because of issues that we captured in the yeah. Dr. Kimani, when you're sharing your thoughts about um, the anti-homosexuality bill, if it had passed, what it would have done uh, in terms of fighting the HIV and AIDS epidemic? I think I would have had a problem with that bill uh, because in Nairobi alone, we have about 20,000 uh, men who have sex with men or gay men. And I uh, also take care of sex workers, as I said, and about 50,000. Uh, when you look at uh, the HIV uh, numbers among Mr. populations, out of 100 among the sex workers, uh, you'd have 28 of them having HIV, that's at 28%. When you look at the MSMs, 34%, that means 34 out of 100 would have HIV. The bill, what we have done, is actually marginalized the already marginalized and vulnerable population. Uh, we're trying to actually, um, you know, we fish them from the community and carry them to actually access care, so at least we can actually provide those services. So the bill will actually create an environment whereby the already marginalized population will actually go underground. Unfortunately, there is no way you can untangle this population from us because from the numbers that we have, 30% of them are bisexual, that means they have they have sex with women. And so there's no way you can actually say that uh, that population of gay men is unique and separate from the rest of the, the rest of us. So whatever happens in the particular community also happens to everybody else. So in a way, it would have been counterproductive because you've actually gained a lot of miles from 2009 when we started working with them. They've actually been coming. Out of the 20,000 we estimate uh, in Nairobi, we already have about 5,000 coming, and we're trying to reach more. But majority of them are actually in the closet because of the stigma associated with uh, their practice. And so if we can create an environment that will actually come out, then it might actually be better for us and for all of us. Manfuli, um, do you feel that the gay and lesbian community has been left out in the fight against HIV and AIDS? Yeah, for me, I think they have been left out because of the stigma and the discrimination from the, the people who are calling them street, uh, street people. Because me, I don't, I don't believe this uh, summary streets. For me, I don't believe. And according to what uh, my friend here is saying, according to the Constitution, I think the Constitution does not say that you, you should not be homosexual. You have a right to be who you are, you have a right to dress court. But what it says is, when you are caught in the act, that is a crime. But being homosexual, being gay, being a lesbian, is not a crime. In the Constitution, the Penal Code of 2009, Cap 162, it says, in addition to attempting to commit the crime of criminal knowledge, against the order of nature is a felony punishable by up to seven years imprisonment and any male person or who whether in public or private commits any act of gross 
indecency with another male person or procures another male person to commit any act of gross indecency with him or attempts to procure the commission of any such act by any male person with himself or with another male person, whether in public or in private, is guilty of a felony and is liable to imprisonment for five years. Eh? That's what the law says. Perhaps you can comment on what you think of the anti-homosexuality uh, bill. You cannot judge me for, for being homosexual because which proof do you have among, I, I am homosexual? If I have, I, I have uh, my male friends in my house, what we are doing there is our secret, so you cannot say that this is a, this two, these two guys are homosexuals. Uh, secondly, uh, the clients of the male who have sex with male or male sex workers, and even the female sex workers, are the married people. So we should come, we, we should join hands together, work together to, fit in, to finish this uh, HIV AIDS. A key component of HIV prevention programming has been missing, and um, for men who have sex with men, eh? don't you think that a bill like this would have like um, conflicted with the, the right to health for all? Going against nature, was uh, it requires a strong uh, structure in the law to make uh, people come back to behave as human beings and not animals. Someone like Mantuli would argue how. Uh, his activity affecting you, that's point number one. Point number two, since you're quoting um, Christianity, one would also argue what about um, uh, having more than one wife, it's a Christian. And then point number three, did the bill put into consideration like uh, men who have anal sex with their wives or girlfriends? Because also that's going against the order of nature. Actually, our proposal criminalizes men doing their wives against nature. Okay. We criminalize uh, using either your mouth, using either any other, okay. any other, other than the prescribed organ by nature. Because the human anatomy uh, is prescribed each body part for a, a particular purpose. And there is peer pressure. That is the that is the effect to our society. Perhaps, Manturi, do you, what, what 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 would you say about peer pressure? Uh, it's nothing like peer pressure because I was born with them and people are born with the yeah. uh, What what happens is if you're a gay person, the only according to me the only the, the, the only the, the only reason why you can be arrested. Uh, it's because it's when you recruit. Dr. is there funding for safety measures and if it's there, is it enough? We estimate uh, Nairobi to have about 20,000 gay men and we've only managed to report 5,000. So we need more funds to actually reach out to the others because the whole issue of stigma and discrimination actually drives them back into the closets. Mm -hmm. uh, if the space was opened up and it was safe, safer for them, I'm sure majority will actually come out to the clinics. But when you look at the HIV prevalence, even among, even you look at the data, the CAIS data is 18.3. We've just finished a study called Transform, and the HIV prevalence in 2018 among the MSMs in Nairobi across board is 26%. Uh, when you look at HIV prevalence among Kenyans, the more Kenyans, it's 6%. There must be something that is actually putting the gay men at risk, and we have to actually find it and actually manage it. And that is what I'm saying that uh, if there was money, uh, maybe we, we shouldn't be asking um, where the snake came through. The issue is that there is a snake, we deal with it. So, um, Mantuli, since most of the um, uh, gay people uh, have not come out like you, eh? They are normally underground because of stigma and all those issues. Where do most of them get information about healthcare, especially HIV and the AIDS, as well as safe uh, sex practices? For those who, know, who, have, who have not come out, it is hard for them to understand that there, there, are, there are some uh, STI and uh, also about uh, health, health information or, or, or education. But for those who, who have come out and uh, they go to the clinics, actually they know. 
but those ones who are like uh, like like dying are those who are in closet. So what what should be done is sensitization of community that uh, uh, MSM are there and they need services. Maybe we could also try to help them. Um, uh, I think there is a lot of misinformation that is being projected by the social media because uh, we realize that. Uh, uh, the traditional hotspots are actually ending, the hotspots whereby people meet uh, for sexual activities. Now people have actually moved to the social media, unfortunately to kind of uh, tease out the truths and the do's and the don'ts from the social media becomes a problem. And that is why it would be very good to create an enabling environment, a safe space for the gay men who are actually in the closet to actually come up. Because when they come to the clinics, we have friendly uh, services and trained individuals to actually treat them. Kenya again is actually at the forefront of ensuring that at least uh, we have choices in terms of HIV prevention. So we've been talking about treatment as prevention and that's why we have antivirus. And uh, we've also had whatever is called post-exposure prophylaxis. Post-exposure prophylaxis happens after you've been exposed. Uh, and that uh, means you're able to take care of yourself if you know you're HIV negative. But again now, in recent days, after you know, strenuous exercises, uh, you know, research activities being conducted uh, across the group and even in Kenya, we've actually, uh, you know, we are very sure that PrEP works. And PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. Most of us, you know, when we're having sex, it is premeditated or it is planned. Uh, yes, there's some individuals that are don't plan it, but when Mantudi leaves his house and he's a sex worker, he knows he's looking for a, a person to actually have sex with for pay. And so we are recommending a prep for individuals at, during the season of risks, whereby if you know you're at risk of acquiring HIV, you can actually take prep before. Luckily, Kenya is the second country uh, to South Africa in Africa to actually provide it, it is accessible, you can actually access it. It is actually the biggest elephant in the room in Kenya because PrEP is you know, available, it is accessible, but the problem is we are not actually utilizing that particular uh, intervention. So for example, we have about 17,000 female sex workers who would qualify for it in Nairobi, and it would actually help in terms of adding into their choices, in terms of HIV prevention. But last year, only 555 actually took it. You can actually see it's a drop in the ocean. And out of those 555 who actually took it, uh, very, very few are actually adhering to uh, the daily dosing. So it is available, but at least we have problems with uptake and adherence mm -hmm. and we need to actually uh, drum up support and create demand for it because it is a good do and it's a good thing it is available and the government is providing it because they know it will actually help us stand the time and the prep works because how comes i'm staying with my partner in one house and we are having a protected sex and i'm negative and the man and my partner is positive so that is to, to prove that prep works okay maybe dr Tari, before i go to edward um, just like the injecting drug users, when the syringes were introduced, uh, there was an outcry that it would encourage drug use, yeah, um, uh, for safety measures against HIV and AIDS. Yeah? One would say it's like a, it's a free way of having careless sex, and then two, it seems like the the fight to use condoms is being lost. It's combination prevention. That means you are adding uh, choices to the pool. Um, there has been all those noises about condom migration. That means uh, you bring in prep and then people stop using condoms. But the dogma and the information is use all of them at the same time. Uh, but um, what I'd like to say is that uh, we don't have any studies that have actually indicated that when you introduce uh, these new interventions, then people stop using condoms. The rate of condom use, as far as I'm concerned from our data, has not changed with or without PrEP. So um, I'm actually very confident that uh, PrEP is actually not going to dislodge anything. Uh, and uh, the only thing that we like to do is to make sure that it's the individuals who qualify the means they're HIV negative and they know their HIV status and they like to access that particular service, then they can added to uh, the condom use. We'll go back to the anti-homosexuality bill then. One of the objectives of the bill is to prohibit the licensing of organizations which promote homosexuality. And part three of the bill, point number 13, 
And point number 13 has number two. And I'll read, where the offender is a corporate body or a business or an association or a non-governmental organization on conviction, its certificate of registration shall be cancelled and the director or proprietor or promoter shall be liable on conviction to imprisonment for life. If you deregister the NGOs that fund HIV and AIDS, because they don't fund separately uh, for homosexual and for the general communi uh, community. It will yes. be unfortunate if uh, uh, they cut funds because we are criminalizing homosexuals. Uh, what we are doing is going against nature, just that, uh, but uh, I, I, with the, the general uh, HIV programs, uh, it should be funded. Any organization that might advertise that uh, should you come to our organization, you will get the services. The services that are already uh, criminalized. Those are the ones that we targeted. This organization, they don't promote. Yeah. They don't promote. It's like uh, the, 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 the clinics now we have, they, it is just for the health services and so, all that. Why are MSMs more vulnerable? What is it about their sexual activity that makes them more vulnerable? Uh, one, poor access to and poor, you know, seeking, you know, health seeking behaviors because they, they have no space, you know, safe spaces to achieve access care. Uh, but when you look at uh, the sexual activity between um, maybe, I would say, two men, uh, then there's a, there's a few challenges here there because the, the, the rectum does not lubricate. Uh, and so what happens is that uh, there's a lot of disruptions. Um, and uh, in terms of, you know, like, uh, the, you know, like the, the, the lining, so it's actually disrupted. And HIV thrives by uh, going through uh, entry points whereby there's disruptions. So that is one of them. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, because uh, they're still stigmatized uh, and they actually hide within the community and they don't have the lot of information, then that stigma actually drives them in. So they actually have sex uh, that is risky and because they don't know, they continue practicing the same, same thing. So I would actually say health seeking behaviors or poor health seeking behaviors will be one of them. And then two, the issues of stigma and then I add biology into it. But among uh, the homosexuals, uh, group sex seems to be a little bit popular. And so if one of them is actually HIV positive and having group sex, then you can actually, the transmission dynamics becomes a little bit more marked. Part two of uh, the anti-homosexuality bill, eh? point number three talks about who offenders of aggravated homosexuality are. Part B says offender is a person living with HIV. Since the bill is about anti-homosexuality, it seems to uh, insinuate that gays, uh, uh, HIV is a gay disease, yet heterosexuals have a higher prevalence of HIV. Well, uh, our target was uh, the person who is aware that he is positive. Mm -hmm. He does not disclose to the partner that is positive and it, it goes ahead to infect the other party. Edward, you could tell us why the anti-homosexuality bill did not go through. The communication we had last was from uh, the Justice and Legal Committee of Parliament uh, who uh, indicated that uh, the penalty we prescribed for aggravated offenders was too harsh. The foreigners were to be uh, killed by stoning in public. Our legal team is uh, still looking at uh, the prospects of uh, returning it. What don't people realize about HIV in the gay community in Kenya? Being an MSM uh, does not mean uh, you are a victim of HIV. They need some, uh, just some more education about uh, HIV. And uh, for the people, like uh, for the bisexual men who are just like hiding there, they should come out to get services because uh, if, they, if they slept with somebody who is HIV positive, they might infect their the waves. Dr. Um, your last question is, um, if you are the cabinet secretary for health, what would you do about uh, the 
this issue of HIV and AIDS uh, prevalence, not only in the gay community but in the general population. Sex work is actually criminalized. Uh, homosexuality is also criminalized. Um, I think um, I wouldn't go for legalization. I think that would not actually serve any purpose, but decriminalizing would actually uh, serve a big purpose because then issues of stigma would actually be, stigma and discrimination would actually be addressed. And that would actually go in a long way in terms of helping us reach the unreached to actually make sure that they are tested and those who actually require services uh, and get with the services. So I'd also put in money in terms of making sure that it's, uh, there's an even uh, playground for everybody, irrespective of your sexual orientation or your gender. So at least uh, in terms of services, currently we think the, the, the level is actually low, you know, like the playground is level, but it's not. Because when you look at the sex workers, they're marginalized. When you look at the gay men, they're marginalized. And that is why, uh, when you look at it very carefully, um, uh, our HIV prevention gap is actually growing and we are not, we are actually off track. We thought we should actually be reducing um, HIV infections to about 500,000 by 2020, and it's still about 1. You know, 2 million so far. So how do we reach 500,000 in 2020 and we are 2018 and it's still 2 million. Much needs to be done and making sure that everybody's tested, they get to know the HIV status and the ones who are HIV infected, they actually should go on treatment and that is what we call treatment and prevention, as prevention. And uh, everybody else who is actually HIV negative either adopt all this prevention or safer sex and maybe also adopt other uh, ARV-based uh, prevention strategies like PrEP and PEP. And that would be, be uh, maybe would be the game changer as far as I'm concerned. Well, that's it from our panelists. Thank you very much for joining us in today's discussion. My takeaway from all this is that in order for the world to realize a HIV and AIDS free society by the year 2030, we have to stop discriminating against vulnerable populations such as the gay community.